Welcome to St. Chad's and St. Mary's online service for today, the 27th of September. Very warm welcome to everyone who's joining us, and especially anyone who's at St. Chad's and not able to attend because the church is closed again at present. But to anyone, wherever you are, a very warm welcome. And just start with a moment of quiet. Unclutter our lives, Lord. We have too much. We consume too much. We expect too much. Grant us perspective to see this world through others' eyes, not just our own. Grant us compassion where there is need, to play our part and not turn aside. Grant us gratitude for what we have, for our daily bread, and the gift of life. And clutter our lives, Lord, give us space, simplicity, and thankful hearts. Amen. Today we're talking about the theme of Creation Tide, as we have for the last few weeks. Last week we looked at harvest, the way God provides for us, for our physical needs and our other needs. Today we're going on to a slightly different theme, that of the gift of Sabbath best. Now unless you're, or were, a fan of heavy metal, perhaps in the 70s, anyone meant hearing the mention of the word Sabbath, you probably think either of a killjoy wanting to take everyone's pleasure away, or thinking of Jesus arguing with the Pharisees about how to use the Sabbath, how it was meant to be used and spent. It was a gift originally intended to bless us, and that's what we'll be looking at today. And the first reading is slightly off not talking about the weekly Sabbath, but again about a Sabbath every seventh year when the whole land itself was given a rest. We'll be looking at that and then the Gospel reading, which again might not be the one you'd expect. Now Linda will be reading to us. And later, David will be leading our intercessions. And in between, we'll be having some worship songs from our music group who are still working very hard to give us the opportunity to worship, even while we can't meet together. And we're not allowed to sing in church anymore. So let's begin our worship. Almighty God, you have broken the tyranny of sin and have sent the Spirit of your Son into our hearts, whereby we call you Father. Give us grace to dedicate our freedom to your service, that we and all creation may be brought to the glorious liberty of the children of God. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen.
The first reading is from Leviticus, chapter 25, verses 1 to 7. The Lord said to Moses on Mount Sinai, Say to the people of Israel, When you come into the land which I give you, the, la the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard, and gather in its fruits. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. What grows of itself in your harvest you shall reap, and the grapes of your undressed vine you shall gather. It shall be a year of solemn rest for the land. The Sabbath of the land shall provide food for you, for yourself, and for your male and female slaves, and for your hired servant, and the sojourner who lives with you, and for your cattle also, and for the beasts that are in your land. All its yield shall be for food. This is the word of the Lord. The Gospel is taken from St John's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 1 to 15. I hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Some time after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he had already in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About five thousand men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed them to those who were seated, as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them, and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign, Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who was to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Can we just pray for a moment before we start. Father, we thank you for your word, living and active in our lives. Grant that as we hear your message today for us, we have an opportunity to meet you, to spend our time with you, to hear your word too. Receive more of your heart our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, today we're looking at the theme of Sabbath rest as part of looking at the creation. Normally we think of the Sabbath day each week The lesson we heard today, the reading, was about the Sabbath year 
once a year, once every seven years. We're told in Leviticus, the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you enter the land I am going to give you, the land itself must observe a Sabbath to the Lord. The land was to have a rest, just like we need a rest one day a week or we wear out. So land being used for farming needs to lie fallow, needs a rest. Once every seven years is God's plan for it. Fields was a policy, was a sort of pattern of doing this across Europe, across Africa, and across Asia. The land would be allowed to rest every few years. Sometimes it was a pattern of every other year, fields would be divided into half, and half would be planted one year, half would be planted the other year. They'd rest in between. Sometimes they did it on a three-year cycle, or a four-year cycle, with three different crops, followed by a rest. As agriculture became more industrialised, it cost more to set up, so that was eating into their profits, and many people decided they'd ignore this sort of pattern that had proved so valuable but would just plant the fields every year. But obviously you don't get a profit if you don't plough the land and plant something. But studies have shown a lot of benefits from allowing crop fields to have a rest every few years. They can benefit from gaining or regaining their nutrients which can be taken out by some plants or often just like to be washed out if it's irrigated too much. And so this was considered essential. It was part of a sort of threefold pattern. You had the weekly Sabbath day, the Every seven years, a Sabbath year, and every seven Sabbath years was what was called the Jubilee. After the 49 years, seven years at a time, the 50th year was to be an extra day called the Jubilee. Consecrate the 50th year, said God, and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. Each of you is to return to your family property and to your own clan. Fiftieth year should be a jubilee. Do not sow and do not reap, or harvest the untended vines. For it is to be holy. In this year of jubilee, everyone was to return to their own property. And in addition, if they'd got into debt, had to sell themselves as bond servants to survive. They were to be set free. They were to be given back their land so that whatever happened in between, they could start again. God could assert that the land was his to be used in his way. But although they'd been put in the land, they could only use it in his way. The land is mine, was what God said about it. Although God gave Israel the land as a blessing, a good gift, yes, he retained the final ownership. He demonstrated his ownership by laws which prevented it being exploited and prevented the people who lived in it being exploited. They didn't possess the land for the tenants and God could terminate their lease if they proved undesirable. It symbolised their life with God. Now today, most people reject 
the whole idea that the land belongs to God. Even though lots of scientific evidence supports the idea that the universe was created and created indeed to support human life. Scientists and non-scientists will often choose to reject this, not because of the evidence, but simply because they've decided to reject it and to reject God in advance. The result of that will come to in a moment. But the account in Exodus is slightly different from the account in Deuteronomy. We get two different sets of instructions on the Sabbath. They're not so very different. They differ in the way they understand what the day means, how important it is. In Exodus we read, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And the Sabbath is to remind us of creation and our part in it. The Deuteronomy account gives a very different reason. Observe the Sabbath by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you, it begins. The details then are the same, but the reason given is very different. Remember, it says, that you were slaves in Egypt, but the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Here there's no reference to the creation. Instead, the law speaks about a historical event, the Exodus. We keep the Sabbath not because God rested on the seventh day, but because he took our ancestors out of Egypt, from slavery to freedom. And we follow that not because we're part of that race, but because Christ transformed that and becomes now a remembrance of Jesus setting us free from slavery to sin. But the Sabbath was a day of rest and freedom, even for servants, even for domestic animals, a one day in seven. No one is a slave. And although the Bible makes it clear that human life is more sacred than animal life, that doesn't mean that animals can be expended or abused or ill-treated. Instead, they too are to rest on the Sabbath. Perhaps this is a surprising thing given the way many people treat animals today. They're surprised even animals are included in the Sabbath rest. Did it all help to build a society based on justice, compassion, love and forgiveness, peace and human dignity? As for the two reasons, they're both absolutely true. We could call the Sabbath a remembrance both of creation and a reminder of the Exodus. Leviticus gives us yet a third picture. These are my appointed festivals, Leviticus says just before the passage we heard read today, early on. The appointed festivals of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. And the Sabbath was one of them. The seventh day is a day of Sabbath rest, a day of sacred assembly. You're not to do any work. Wherever you live, it's a Sabbath to the Lord. It's as if God had personally invited us to be dinner guests at his table, 
Sabbath doesn't look back just to the birth of the universe or to our redemption, doesn't look forward to a future redemption. It does all those things, but also it celebrates the present moment as our private time with God it represents the time of now. As I said, the people found this a burden instead of a blessing. Those who didn't want to spend their time with God, those who rejected the idea of serving God, they'd much rather just get on with their work, get on with their profit making. Amos has harsh words for those who trample the needy, who do away with the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over? we may sell grain, and the Sabbath be ended, that we may market wheat, skimping on the measure, boosting the price, and cheating with dishonest scales, buying the poor with silver, and the needy for a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings with the wheat. Once they decided they didn't want to spend any time in God's presence, and they cheated God of his time, they soon began cheating their neighbours too, boosting the price, skimping on the measure. And God warned the people that that would be a serious matter. Right back the time, just start in the chapter, just after the passage we heard, God warns your land will be laid waste if you don't obey the commands. Your cities will lie in ruins. Then the land will enjoy its Sabbath years all the time it lies desolate, and you're in the country of your enemies. Then the land will rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. The land will have the rest it didn't have during the Sabbaths you lived in it. And this came to pass. At the time of Nebuchadnezzar, he set fire to God's temple in Jerusalem and broke down the walls. He burned all the palaces, destroyed everything of value. He carried into exile in Babylon the remnant who escaped from the sword. They all became servants to him and his successors until the kingdom of Persia came to power. The land enjoyed its Sabbath rests after all. All the time of its desolation of seventy years, it rested until the years were completed in fulfilment of the word spoken by Jeremiah. Roughly 490 years it would take to build up a debt of seventy years. That was about the time that they were there from the time they arrived till the time of the exile. How different from those who love to spend time with God. They too joined in the loss. They too were taken away. Even there, they couldn't be deprived of God's presence. But the whole people suffered together. Moving on to the Gospel account, we don't get, as I say, any discussion of the Sabbath, any healing on the Sabbath, or the way Jesus did. Instead, we hear how Jesus fed a multitude, a crowd, with just five loaves and two fish. We're told he travelled from Jerusalem, travelled up to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. We're also told it happened around the time of the Passover, feast established to remember how God had set the people free. And there are strong similarities in what Jesus says later in this chapter and the words we hear describing what happened in the Exodus. 
Jesus fed the crowd, just as Moses had fed the Israelites out in the desert. So here in the desert place, Jesus fed this great crowd, not just feeding them with a small amount, but actually leaving a large amount over. Jesus is able to do this, pointing to the fact that Jesus was here to fulfill all that God had promised. Ultimately, the Sabbath, like everything else in the Old Testament, points to Christ for its fulfilment. Christ, our Redeemer, to whom all things were created, who brings rest to the people of God. Brings that rest, we're told in Hebrews, those who will receive his rest. He promises it himself. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Sabbath, like the other commandments, wasn't meant as a burden. It was a blessed release from hard labour. A blessing. And the holiness of this day separates it so that it can be enjoyed with God by sharing his rest, celebrating his work of creation and redemption. We meet with God. We have the opportunity to spend time with him. Whether it's God's call to us or our call to him, whether he initiates the meeting or we do, we have holy time together, time which becomes almost like a lover's rendezvous, a weekly date, an opportunity to have a still point in the world that keeps turning, when creator and creation can make time for one another, know one another in what we call prayer, and in the form of knowledge that we call love. This transforms us, transforms our whole attitude, this experience of God who created the universe, whose presence fills our homes with light, our lives with wisdom, who will one day lead us to a world of freedom, and justice and peace. But meanwhile, here on earth now, just as we see the world suffering from the way we've treated it, the way we've exploited it, the way we've made our own profit more important and caring for the land. We have to remember that we are the Earth's guardians. We look after it on behalf of its creator. We look after it for the sake of future generations. It's important we have a, a vision that shows us, that reminds us that the land belongs to God it doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. We to look after it for God as he originally commanded. And we're to look after it for future generations, our children, our grandchildren, and so on. So it's that God who blesses us in so many ways. May we offer our might our worship and praise to his might, his majesty. May we worship him and come to love him more and more each day. In Jesus' name. Amen.
before God, with the people of God. Let us pray to our Lord, Saviour, Redeemer and Friend, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, present with us now. Father God, as we continue to live in these times of uncertainty, protect us, Lord, and be with us, especially those most vulnerable during this coronavirus crisis. Move us to reach out in love to our neighbours near and far. We pray especially for healthcare workers, to medical doctors, nurses and the supporting staff who are on the front line of the fight against COVID-19. Heavenly Father, sustain and protect them. We pray that your spirit might inspire those researching new medicines and treatments and as an effective vaccine to combat the virus be speedily found. And in the midst of this, keep us strong in faith, hope and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we pray for those who are guiding our nation at this time and shaping national policies, that they may make wise decisions and be guided by a true desire to work for the common good. We pray for peace, justice and reconciliation throughout the world. We pray for the honouring of human rights and for the relief of the oppressed. We give thanks for all that is gracious in the lives of men, women and children. Almighty, Almighty God, the Father of all humanity, turn, we pray, the hearts of all peoples and their rulers, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, peace may be established among the nations on the foundation of justice, righteousness and truth, through him who is lifted upon the cross to draw all people to himself, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray for the renewal of the church in faith, love and service and for the life of our communities at St Chad's and St Mary. We give thanks for the gift of your word, for Christian people everywhere, that we may joyfully proclaim and live our faith in Jesus Christ. In peace, let us pray to Jesus our Lord, who ever lives to make intercession for us. And in a quiet moment, let us bring before God those known to us who are in need of healing and wholeness. Saviour of the world, be present in all places of suffering, violence and pain, and bring hope even in the darkest night. Inspire us to continue your work of reconciliation today. Lord, in your mercy, hear, I pray, hear our prayer. Almighty and most merciful God, we remember before you all the poor and neglected persons who it would be easy for us to forget, the homeless and the destitute, the young, the old and the sick, and all who have none to care for them. Help us to heal those who are broken in body or spirit and to turn their sorrow into joy. Grant this, Father, for the love of your Son, who for our sake became poor, Jesus Christ our Lord. We are not people of fear, we are people of courage. We are not people who protect our own safety, we are people who protect our neighbour's safety. We are not people of greed, we are people of generosity. We are your people, God giving and loving, wherever we are, whatever it costs, for as long as it takes, wherever you call us. And finally, Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your disciples, I am with you always. Be with us all today as we offer ourselves to you. Hear our prayers for others and for ourselves and keep us in your care. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
So that brings us to the conclusion of today's service. And I'd like to thank everyone who's helped in putting it together. I don't want to repeat all the intercessions, but I would like to send my own best wishes. I'm sure we'd all like to send our prayers, our love and best wishes to Marion on the loss of Peter this week. Peter and Marion have both been friends of mine, as well as uh, important, significant members of this church for a number of years. I'm sure we all want to pray for Marion and her family at this time. And I also send my own best wishes and prayers for the Reverend Les Reese, who's priest in charge over at Hanbury. He's um, had a major operation this week. I was pleased to hear that he'd done well in it and seems to be on the road to recovery. So prayers and best wishes for him. And also, can we pray for Duncan Gorewood? He's a curate at St John's Horninglow and he's been ordained to the priesthood this weekend. It was meant to be during um, June been postponed because of Covid. Pray for his ministry and the work of the parish there in St John's. Also pray for all the others who are being ordained this weekend, both in Litchfield Diocese and across the country. We give thanks because Christ came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He calls his faithful servants to lead his holy people in love, nourishing them by his word and sacraments. So God, who in generous mercy sent the Holy Spirit upon your church in the burning fire of your love, grant that your people may be fervent in the fellowship of the gospel, that always abiding in you, we may be found steadfast in faith, active in service. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. I hope you found this service both inspiring and helpful in helping you to live your lives in this rather difficult time. Also, to 
follow Jesus more closely. If there's anything you'd like to discuss, either about the uh, service or about anything in your lives, if you'd like prayer for any reason, we'd be delighted to talk to you. There'll be some contact details coming up in just a few moments. May God the Father who created the world give you grace to be wise stewards of his creation. God the Son who redeemed the world inspire you to go out as labourers into his harvest. And God the Holy Spirit whose breath fills the whole creation help you to bear his fruits of love, joy and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. So look after yourselves this week. Stay safe. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.